Hello, everyone. In this mini course, I will be discussing the structure of rich drinkers. First of all, I will give some motivation. That is why we care about. And then by after proving some structure theorems, I will give a brief classification of low dimensional rich drinkers. So that is classification of low dimensional rich shrinkers. So that is when the dimension n is less or equal to three. As we know, the classification of low dimensional rich shrinkers uh, plays the important role for the study of low dimensional rich flow. Then I will talk about Pair mass entropy. So pair mass entropy was originally defined on the compact rich flow. So I will discuss how we generalize the concept to the setting of rich shrinkers. Then by using the pair mass entropy, I will prove some structure theorems. So for the last part, I will give the, some application for those structure theorems, including the weak compactness and by considering the moduli space of the rich shrinkers. So that is moduli space and the weak compactness theory. So without any further ado, so let's talk about why we care about the rich shrinkers. So first of all, let's discuss some basic stuff of rich flow. So as we know, given a Riemannian manifold, let's see MNG zero, then we can consider the rich flow equation. The rich flow equation is defined by the following parabolic equation. It's defined as the partial G partial T is equal to negative two rich G. So of course we require that G starts with G zero. So G zero is the given background metric. So this is the rich flow equation and the rich flow can be regarded as the heat equation on the Riemannian manifold. If you rewrite everything uh, under the harmonic coordinates, then the right-hand side would be uh, the Laplacian of G plus some lower order term. Now for any smooth Riemannian manifold, as long as the original condition is sufficiently fine, though we can start the rich flow. So that gives us the short time existence. So I will only list two special cases. So actually that applies to more general setting, but we only care about those two. So the first one would be compact manifold. So when M is compact. So this was originally proved by Hamilton and De Turk. The second special case is when M G zero, which might be uncompact has bounded curvature. So the first one should be natural. And the second one can be compared to the solution of heat equation when you have a bounded initial function. So by the short time existence, I mean the flow at least exists for a short time. That means the Ricci flow with the given initial condition exists when T is greater or equal to zero and less than some capital T. 
Here, the capital T might be finite or infinite. If the capital T is infinite, that means the Ricci flow has long time existence. Now, if the capital T is finite, then it's called the singular time. So then it is called the singular time. The reason is proved by Hamilton that when you reach the singular time T, the curvature at some time, uh, at the curvature at some point might blow up. That means the T is finite if and only if the maximum of M times zero and T of the Riemannian curvature should be infinite. So if you take a space time point, PI, TI, when TI go into capital T, uh, there at least exists one sequence of space time point so that the curvature blows up. So let me draw a graph to um, describe this. So for instance, if you have a metric on a dumbbell-like manifold, so when you flow the Ricci flow, and when the time approaches the capital time, that is singular time, the neck part, here I use a different color. So the neck part will be shrinking to a lot. So as can be seen from this graph, that means some point on this neck will have infinite curvature. Now, how to understand the geometry and topology near the singularity? That is when T approaches the singular time. The common method is to use a blow up argument. That is the point picking and blow up argument. Specifically speaking, that means if the curvature at some space time point is sufficiently large, we can rescale that, we can rescale the metric so that the curvature becomes bounded. So that means if I have a sequence of point xi ti such that the ti approach the capital T, and if the curvature at this point blows up, then we rescale the metric around this space time point. So if the ki denotes the Riemannian curvature at this space time, so presumably this ki will converge to positive, infin positive infinity, then we can define the rescaled metric that is GIT defined by KI, G, KI inverse T plus T. Notice that this rescaled metric still is a solution of the Ricci flow. So in particular, this should be regarded as a rescaled solution of the Ricci flow. Now for the new metric or the new solution of the Ricci flow, the time T is well defined bounded below by negative ti ki until it reaches capital ti minus little ti times ki. So this is from the original interval for the unrescaled Ricci flow. Now by our assumption, since the capital ki goes to positive infinity, we know that the lower bound for the rescaled Ricci flow, that is negative ti ki will converge to negative infinity. So that means if this sequence of rescaled Ricci flow converges, the defining time t should be any number as long as it's in between negative infinity and some finite or infinite number. So by this, I mean, if we consider the sequence 
mgit based at the base point xi, we consider the possible limit for this new sequence of Ricci flows. In most interesting case, this sequence will be convergent to a limit space, m infinity, g infinity t, and x infinity. Here by convergence, I mean the convergence in the chigar gromov sense. That means the convergence is smooth. Now, if the convergence is smooth, then the limit Ricci flow should be defined for any t in between negative infinity and some finite number c. Here, this finite number c should be uh, either a finite number or positive infinity. Now, as long as we have a Ricci flow solution, which is defined uh, for t in between negative infinity to some number, then we call such Ricci flow an Asian solution. So here we call this an Asian solution. to the Ricci flow. Okay. Now here, uh, I assume that the convergence is smooth. So this happens in most interesting case, uh, but that's for not all, but if you choose any time sequence, uh, the convergence might not exist it's possible that uh, the limit space, even it does, it's possible that the limit space has some mild singularities. And uh, even worse, the collapsing behavior might happen if you consider the convergence. Okay, now by this picture, we know that if we want to understand the geometry and topology around a singular time, we can use the blow up argument to obtain a limit. As long as we know uh, the behavior for the limit, which is an Asian solution, then we can understand the topology and geometry before the limit. That means the behavior around the singular space time x, i, and t. So that is why we see an Asian solution models the singularity of the Ricci flow. So if we can, hopefully, if we can understand all the Asian solutions, then we can understand the singularities of the Ricci flow. Now, for any Asian solution to the Ricci flow, the investigation is highly non-trivial and difficult. So this is not a complete even for three-dimensional case. So in this mini course, we will only consider a special kind of Asian solution to the Ricci flow which has some self-similar property. And that is the Ricci shrinker. Now we can define what a Ricci shrinker is. So some, some answer also called this a Ricci shrinking solitaire. So I will use the Ricci shrinker. Now a Ricci shrinker is a complete Riemannian manifold MN GF. So it's a Riemannian manifold coupled with a potential function F satisfies the following elliptic equations. That is the Ricci curvature plus the Haitian of F is equal to g over two. Now notice that for the right-hand side, the coefficient of g is one half. So this is not very important as long as it's positive. You can always rescale the metric to uh, make the one half to be any positive number. Now a special case for this should be the positive Einstein manifold. That is when the potential function f is equal to zero, so the Hessian term vanishes. So this is standard Einstein equation. Now, why can we say a Ricci shrinker is 
a self-seminar solutions to the Asian, uh, to the Ritchie flow. Now by using the defining potential function F, we can construct a vector field. So we can define a vector field X by gradient F over one minus T. Then we can consider a family of diffeomorphism. So one parameter family of diffeomorphism. induced by X. So we denote that by psi t. Now we can define the associated Ricci flow by GT is defined as one minus T, the pullback of psi t of the original metric G. Now, given a Ricci shrinker, we can define a smooth family of metric GT by this way. Then it's easy to compute by direct calculation that this GT satisfies the Ricci flow equation. So this satisfies the Ricci flow equation. Now in this way, we can see the solution defined in this way is a self-similar way. That is the only difference between GT and G is uh, we have a scaling factor one minus T. So when T approaches one, the scaling factor approaches zero. So that GT is actually shrinking. And the other difference is we, those two are different by uh, diffeomorphism, psi T star. But geometrically speaking, those two have the same geometric property. So that is why we call uh, such solution a self-similar shrinking solution to the Ricci flow. Moreover, as we can see by this definition, as long as the scaling one minus T is positive, this metric GT is well-defined. So this GT is well-defined. for any t less than one. So in particular, this GT is an Asian solution. So in this way, we can regard any Ricci shrinker as a special self-similar Asian solutions to the Ricci flow. So this is uh, why we care about the Ricci shrinker. Okay, next I will give some examples for Ricci shrinkers. First example is the trivial case. That is the standard Euclidean space with the flat metric. And we can choose the potential function F as the distance squared over four. Then one can check that uh, it indeed satisfies the equation for the rich shrinker. Basically, that means the Haitian Fe is equal to G over two. So in this case, the rich curvature is flat. Now this flat case is also called the Gaussian solution. Now the second case is all positive Einstein manifold. So as we discussed in the definition of bridge shrinkers, when the potential function is constant or zero, then that degenerates to the positive Einstein equation. So that is when the potential function is zero. So the examples include or standard one like the SN or CPN or other compact symmetric space.
Now the third one should be the combination of first two. That is, we take a positive Einstein manifold cross a flat piece RK, then we can define the potential function F as the X squared over four, where X is the coordinate for RK and N is a positive Einstein manifold. So still one can check that by this choice, it satisfies the ricci schrinker equations. Now, another example, which might not be uh, as trivial as the first three is the, the one in the four dimensional case, that is the CP2 blow up one or two point. So when K is equal to one or two. So as we know that when K is in between three and eight, it admits a positive Einstein metric. And when K is uh, equal to one and two, we can construct a rich Schinker metric. Now there are other non-compact examples and uh, some double warped product uh, example in higher dimensional. Uh, so I will not talk about those. Uh, generally speaking, the examples for uh, rich Schinker's other than the positive Einstein manifold uh, is not uh, very much. So we can, um, it's actually a very interesting question that is how many rich shrinkers can we find other than the positive Einstein manifold. Now, luckily for the three dimensional case or two dimensional case, or those rich shrinkers belongs to one of the first three types. So let me write down the theorem, which we will prove later. That is the classification of two and three dimensional rich shrinkers. This was done by Hamilton, Pyramid, and others. So this theorem states that all rich shrinkers I should say, or two or three dimensional Ricci shrinkers are R2, S2, R3, S3, R times S2, and their quotients. So basically for two dimensional case, there are only R2, S2 and RP3. And for the three dimensional case, there are Euclidean space, the space form and the cylinder case with their quotients. So as we can check that any, anyone uh, in this classification belongs to one of the three types I mentioned before. However, for four dimensional case, the classification is far from complete, um, partly because we have to include all positive Einstein manifold. So even for non-Einstein case, the classification is not complete. Okay. Now to prove this theorem, we have to do some uh, basic stuff. That is, we try to, first of all, establish some basic estimate and structure theorems on the rich shrinkers. Then we can uh, go back to talk about the proof for this classification theorem. So the first theorem are some basic identities in the rich shrinkers. Now throughout, I will assume that this triple is a rich shrinker. 
So it, that satisfies the rich Schwinker equation. Now the first identity is R plus Laplacian F is equal to N over two. The second one is R plus gradient F squared minus F is equal to a constant. And the third one is the Ricci curvature acts on the gradient F is one half gradient R. So those three are basic estimates uh, on the Ricci shrinkers. So we try to give a sketch of proof for those identities. Now recall that for Ricci shrinker, it satisfies the Ricci curvature plus Haitian F is equal to G over two. We try to derive all three identities from the definition. Now, the first one is easy. We simply take trees of the defining equation. Take the trees, we get R plus Laplacian F is N over two. Now, the second one is a little bit more involved. So we try to take the divergence of the original equation. So we try to uh, do a computation. That is the divergence Ricci plus divergence Haitian F is equal to zero. That is divergence G over two automatically becomes zero. Now by the basic identity divergence Ricci is one half gradient JR. And the second one is gradient I, gradient I, gradient JF is equal to zero. Now we exchange uh, the order of the covariant derivatives. That is the second term becomes gradient J, gradient I, gradient IF plus the Ricci, I use the local coordinates, that is the Ricci JK, FK. Now here, the gradient I gradient F is just the Laplacian. So I can change this term to the Laplacian F. Now for the last term, we use the dividing equation for the ricci schwinker by replacing Ricci with uh, G over two minus Hessian F. So this becomes one half gradient J R plus gradient J Laplacian F plus F J over two minus F J K F K. Now for the last term, we can rewrite it as the gradient J gradient F squared over two. So by pulling out the gradient J, we get gradient J one half R plus Laplacian F plus one half F minus one half gradient F squared. Then this is equal to zero. So that means the term in the bracket should be a constant. But before we do that, we can further simplify that by using the first identity, that is R plus Laplacian F is uh, N over two. So this becomes gradient J F minus R minus gradient F squared. So this is equal to zero. So here I multiply the last equation by a constant two. Okay. Now at this point, we can conclude that F minus R minus gradient F squared must be a constant. Now notice that in the def definition of a rich shrinker, the F is not uniquely defined. You can always add a constant to F. So in order to uh, determine 
the potential function f will always add a constant to f such that the last constant c becomes zero. So that means we add a constant to f such that the r plus gradient f squared is equal to f. So this is our normalization. Okay. Now, actually, in the proof of the second identity, we have also proved the third one. So you just uh, track the last proof, that is how we change the Ricci uh, at the gradient F to one half gradient R. So you just rewrite everything that you get the last item. So here I will not uh, go into details for the third one. Now, before we talk about the next theorem, I will introduce some notations. Now here, the first notation is the weighted Laplacian. So that is denoted by Laplacian F, which is defined by the Laplacian operator minus gradient F as gradient X. So this means we have a drift term. So that also can be interpreted as the weighted term uh, along this Laplacian operator. Notice that the new weighted Laplacian is not self-adjoint with respect to the original volume form. It's actually self-adjoint with respect to the weighted volume. So now we define the volume form dvf as the e to the negative f dv. Here dv is the original volume form defined by the metric. Then it's easy to check that the Laplacian f is self-adjoint with respect to this new measure dvf. So moreover, we can derive the following identity that is also the integration by parts with the new measure. So that is Laplacian F U times V DF is U times Laplacian F V DVF is negative gradient U gradient V DVF. So as long as one of the function has compact support and the other one is smooth. So we can uh, easily check that it satisfies the integration by parts formula. Okay, now with this notation, we can derive more identity from the ricci schwinker equation. So that, that consists of some second order elliptic equations, uh, which applies to a variety of curvatures for this Ricci shrinkers. Now, the second theorem are some identities. So that includes Laplacian F on F is equal to N over two minus F. The second one is Laplacian F R is R minus two Ricci squared. And the third one is Laplacian F on the Ricci curvature, Rij, is Rij minus 2 Rikjl Rkl. Here, the last term involves the Riemannian curvature. Now, the last one is the Laplacian F on the Riemannian curvature operator. This is equal to the Riemannian minus Q Riemann. Here, the last term is a quadratic term of the Riemannian curvature operator. So we will not care about uh, the exact definition in this mini course. So 
So I just want to mention that this is a quadratic term, just like uh, the other two, like the Laplacian FR and Laplacian F rich. So all of them contain a quadratic term. Now, I will only prove the first one and uh, specify how to uh, prove the other three. Now for the first one, we simply use the definition that is Laplacian F on F is Laplacian F minus gradient F squared. Then by using the identity we derived before, that is Laplacian F plus R is an over two and the gradient F squared plus R is equal to F. So if I take the difference between those two, then we get the Laplacian F minus gradient F squared is an over two minus F. Notice that here we have determined our normalization. Now for the other three, I will not do the uh, explicit calculation. Those three identities can be derived by considering the evolution equation for the rich flow. So for two, three, four, we can consider the evolution equation, the equations of R, Ricci, and Riemannia under the Ricci flow. Notice that for any Ricci thinker can be regarded as a self-similar solutions of the, to the Ricci flow. So if we can use the evolution equations for those curvature under the Ricci flow to derive those identities. For instance, under the Ricci flow, we know that partial T minus, grade, minus Laplacian on R is equal to two Ricci squared. So if we rewrite this evolution equation uh, by choosing the time T to be zero, then this is equivalent to Laplacian F, R is equal to R minus two Ricci squared. So this is because we define our metric GT as one minus T psi T star G. By using the definition of psi T, uh, we can show that those two equations are equivalent. Now, similarly, we can use the evolution equations for Ricci curvature and Riemannian curvature. Then we can derive the other two identities. So here is just an idea how we uh, derive those identities. Now you can also compute those identities directly by using the definition of Ricci shrinkers. So basically that involves a lot of calculations. Now, next I will prove a rigidity theorem so this theorem, we need to use a result of Bing Long Chen. So he showed that for any complete Asian solutions to the Ricci flow, the scalar curvature R is always non-negative. So this is actually a very uh, important result, even though the proof is not, uh, not too difficult. That means for any Asian solution, we can at least know uh, one curvature has a non-negativity property. So even though the scalar, even though the curvature is a scalar curvature, which is the uh, kind of weakest of curvatures, now I will only give a sketch of the proof. Now the idea of the proof is we consider the evolution equations for the scalar curvature under the rich flow. Uh, as I wrote before, this is partial T is Laplacian R 
plus two which is squared. And by the standard inequality, this is greater or equal to Laplacian R plus two R squared over N, right? So if we define a phi t as the minimum for all X of the scalar curvature Rxt, then the phi t satisfies the ODE inequality. That is d phi dt would be greater or equal to two phi squared over n. So let's assume that this Asian solution is defined for all t less or equal to zero. So this is true for t less or equal to zero. Then by solving the last ODE, we can show that this phi must be non-negative. Okay. Now, in this way, we can show the scalar curvature is non-negative. Here, this is just a sketch for the proof, which is oversimplified. Uh, in the actual proof, there are some difficulty to overcome. First of all, the phi t might not be well-defined. So uh, one needs to use the localization argument by choosing some cutoff function so that uh, this uh, argument can be localized. Okay. Now, when we apply chance result to the rich shrinker, that means any rich shrinkers must have non-negative scalar curvature because the rich shrinker is a special kind of uh, Asian solution. So now we have our third theorem that is for any rich shrinker, the scalar curvature is always non-negative. Actually, we can show a little bit stronger statement that is the scalar curvature is always positive unless the rich shrinker is equal to the Euclidean space. So that means if we have one point at which the scalar curvature is zero, then this rich shrinker must be isometric to the Euclidean space. So this gives us a rigidity theorem of a rich shrinker. Now, I'll give a proof. First of all, we know that by chain theorem, the scalar curvature is always non-negative. Now we consider the evolution equation, sorry, the elliptic equation. We have the Laplacian FR is R minus two rich squared. And by dropping the last term, this is less or equal to R. Now, since R is non-negative, we can use the standard strong maximal principle for the elliptic equation. That means either so by the strong maximal principle. We know that either R is identically zero or R is positive everywhere. Now we only need to show that in the first case, this is equal to the Euclidean space. Now in the first case, when R is identically zero, we can derive from the evolution equation that the Ricci curvature is equal to zero from Laplacian FR is R minus two rich squared. Now back to our definition of the rich shrinkers, we have patient F plus rich is equal to T over two. That gives us Haitian F is equal to T over two. Now, Actually, we have a rich flat metric so that there exists a potential function so that Haitian F is G over two. Now, by the standard argument, which I will omit, that means this 
metric is actually a flat cone. Since this is a smooth manifold, this flat cone must be isometric to the Euclidean space. So combining this with the Ricci flat condition, we can derive that the M is Euclidean space. So in this way, we have proved our first rigidity theorem. That means as long as scalar curvature is zero at one point, then it must be the Euclidean space. In some sense, the trivial case. So in the following argument, I will always assume that the scalar curvature is everywhere positive uh, so that we do not consider uh, the flat case. Now, next I will prove a very important theorem, which is about the estimate for the potential function. So this was proved by Chow and Zhou and uh, Hushofer and Muller. Now this theorem gives us a pretty, uh, a pretty precise estimate for the potential function. So it states that the potential function fx is bounded above by one fourth dpx plus square root of two n squared and bounded below by one fourth dpx minus five n plus squared. Here, the subscript plus means the positive part. Here, P is a minimal point of F. So first of all, this theorem states that a minimal point of the potential function F must exist. Moreover, uh, when we choose P as a minimal point, the potential function satisfies this estimate. As we can see, when X is far away from P, the FX is almost equal to the D square over four. So this can be compared to the case in the standard uh, Euclidean metric case, when the function is exactly X squared over four. Now I will give a proof for this theorem. So first of all, we notice that from the identity gradient F squared plus R is equal to F. Since the scalar curvature is always non-negative, we have gradient F squared is less or equal to F. Now notice that this can be rewritten as gradient square root of F is less or equal to one half. That means the square root of F should be one half Lipschitz. So here by the first identity, we in particular know F must be non-negative. So the square root of F is well-defined. Now I choose any two point PQ in the space and I connect those two by uh, geodesic. Now I can compare the values of F um, at those two different points. First of all, by the one half Lipschitz property, I have square root of FQ is less or equal to square root of FP plus one half DPQ, right? So somehow I can estimate the upper bound for FQ by FP. So later I will choose P as the minimal point, but so, but at this point, we do not know whether or not such minimal point exists. So this is the first inequality we derived. Now to further estimate that we use the second variational formula along this geodesic connecting P and Q. So moreover, by the second variational formula, 
we know that the integral from zero to d phi squared Ricci gamma dot gamma dot is less or equal to a minus one integral from zero to d phi prime squared. Here I denote the minimizing geodesic between p and q by gamma and the phi is any cut of function along this geodesic. So this is the second variational formula along this geodesic. Now we can choose a special kind of the cut of function. So we can choose phi as s if s is less or equal to one and phi is the constant one if s is in between one and d minus one and when s is greater or equal to d minus one and less or equal to uh, d so we choose that to be d minus s so here d is the distance between p and q now notice that by this choice this is a well-defined part of function so we can use this choice uh, by combining with the second variational formula we can derive the inequality we, we want. So here we can use some notation. We can define the function f as defined as the potential function f along this geodesic gamma x. Then we know that f prime s would be the gradient f with gamma dot and the f double prime s would be the Haitian f evaluated at gamma dot gamma dot. Now by our definition, we know that the Ricci gamma dot gamma dot would be one half minus f double prime s. Now by using this choice for phi and through the definition, we know that the left-hand side is equal to the integral from zero to d phi squared, one half minus f double prime s ds. Then by using uh, the definition for phi, we can compute the first term and for the second term, we use the integration by part. So by some direct calculation, this is d over two minus two thirds, then plus the integral from zero to d two phi phi prime f prime s. Now notice that the f prime s is the inner product of gradient f with gamma prime. In particular, it should be bounded by the absolute value of gradient f. So the left-hand side should be greater or equal to d over two minus two thirds, then minus supremum when s is in between zero and one of f prime s minus supremum when s is in between d minus one and d of f prime s. Notice that f prime s is bounded by the gradient f. So this is bounded below by d over two minus two thirds minus gradient fp minus gradient fq the minus one. So here we have used the fact that the gradient f squared is less or equal to f and the thing square root of f f is one half lipids, so we have the last term. Now we can estimate uh, the right-hand side just by direct calculation. So combining uh, the right-hand side and left-hand side, we have so from this star and the choice of our phi, we have square root of fp plus square root of fq, this is greater or equal to d over two minus two n 
plus one thirds. Now notice that the FP and FQ, uh, so P and Q are any two points on the manifold. And from this inequality, if P is fixed, and when Q uh, moves to the infinity, the value for FQ will converge to positive infinity. That means the minimal point for F must exist. So F has a minimal point. Right? So now we can choose that point to be our P. Now we can combine two inequality we derive. The first one is uh, the square root of FQ plus square root of FP is greater or equal to the right-hand side formula. And this gives us the lower bound for FQ. And another one is the square root of FQ is less or equal to square root of FP plus one half P. Now, in order to finish the proof, we have to give an estimate for FP. Since P is the minimal point, we can derive that by using the elliptic equation for F. Now from the equation Laplace and F is N over two minus F. We know that by evaluating that at the point P, we know that the FP must be less or equal to N over two. Since P is a minimal point. So after we have determined the value for FP, of course, it should be bounded below by zero. Then we can give an FQ. So combining those two inequalities I circled, we can obtain the original estimate for our function FX. Okay. So this is how we derived the potential, the estimate for the potential function. So this is actually a pretty strong estimate, it gives us the behavior for F, uh, in particular when X is far away from the minimal point P. Now, one consequence for this estimate is the following fact for the fundamental group. Now, one corollary is if MGF to be a rich shrinker, then the pi one, should always be finite. Okay. Now, how can we prove this? We just need to estimate the number for the pre-image of a fixed point. Now we consider the universal cover of the given Ricci shrinker. Now we denote it by M tilde, G tilde, F tilde. So we just pull back everything to its universal cover. Then we have a map from that to our original Ricci shrinker. Now, since the potential function F is the pullback of our original F, we know that the universal cover is also a Ricci shrinker. In particular, it satisfies all the estimates for Ricci shrinker. Now we let P be a minimal point of F and P tilde is a pre-image or I should say P tilde is a pre-image of P under pi. So P tilde satisfies pi P tilde is equal to P. Then we can estimate the potential function F tilde with respect to P tilde. That means we have the F tilde by the last theorem, F tilde X is bounded above by one fourth DG tilde X P tilde plus square root of two N squared and bounded below by one fourth GT tilde, XP tilde 
minus 5n plus 4. Notice that this estimate also applies to F tilde because it is a rich shrinker. Now, for any P1, which is a pre-image of P with pi P1 is equal to P. Now we can use the estimate because P1 is also a minimal point for F tilde. We know that F tilde P1 is always less or equal to N over two. So we have derived this as before. Now we can estimate the distance between P1 and P tilde. So from this estimate, we know that the distance between P1 and P tilde is less or equal to 5n plus square root of 2n. Okay. Now that means any pre-image of P should be contained in a fixed sized ball centered at P tilde. In other words, the pi inverse P is contained in the BG tilde, P tilde, 5n plus square root two. Then by a compactness argument, we know that uh, the pre-image must be finite. So this must be finite. So the universal uh, for any uh, minimal point P is pre-image is finite. So the fundamental group must be finite. This way we know that pi one M is finite. So this is actually a very interesting result for rich shrinker. That means many, uh, so since the, the fundamental group is always finite, so we can derive that uh, many useful property uh, from this basic fact. Okay, this is our first lecture. So for the next lecture, I will talk about more of the fundamental estimate on the rich shrinkers.